She's the push she brought from the Bronx, New York. Follow her voice, a straight dog is nice. She's the push she brought from the Bronx, oh yeah. Don't be surprised if you want to listen twice. Make decisions, find the right choice. Know yourself better, find your own voice. It's okay if you need help today, because everybody needs a little push. From the push she brought from the Bronx, New York. Hello and welcome Transformation Talk Radio listeners. My name is Ellen Stewart and I am the pushy broad from the Bronx. Welcome to my show, which started about six weeks ago called Women Who Push For More. I've been on Transformation Talk Radio for quite some time now, but I'm rolling out this brand new show to give women a chance to inspire and encourage other women. Today, I have a very special guest with me that's going to tell you about her fabulous adventures. I'd love to introduce to you a woman named Emma Warren, and she has an Instagram site and a Facebook site called Walk, Scramble, Climb. I know that you will be very interested in hearing what Emma does and how she is a woman who pushes for more. Transformation Talk Radio listeners, welcome Emma Warren. Oh, lovely to have me on. Thank you very much, Ellen. <laughs> I'm so glad that you're with me today. We started to talk about the fact that I sent out a post because I wanted to interview women who had amazing stories about they were their about how were they they were their own true pushy broads and how they pushed for more. And I want to share with our readers a little bit about what you said and the email that attracted me. And then I want to talk about that with you. Okay. Yeah. You said that the, at the age of 18, you decided to cross the Silk Route on a rock climbing expedition, traveling from London to Hong Kong. At 25, you led a bunch of climbers from South Africa overland to Jordan. You've led expeditions all over the world. You've li you live in the UK right now in the Welsh mining village of Clanberis, which is famous for its rock climbing. And you have a Facebook site called Walk, Scramble, Climb. So my first question to you is, how did the excitement come to you to begin to rock climb? How, how old were you when that started? So um, when I was 18, I was really wanted to have a year out before university. So when I was doing my A-levels, I kind of, I went on an expedition with school at the age of 17 to India, and that kind of sparked my passion for travel. So kind of in my last year of A-levels, which is what you do before you go to university in the UK, um, I was already like starting to think, right, I want more of this. I had such an amazing time trekking in the Indian Himalayas as a 17 year old that I thought I want to do more of this. So I went with my mum to the Daily Telegraph Travel Show, which is like a big newspaper in, 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 in the UK. Um, and they have this travel show with lots of ideas of where to go traveling. And I picked up a brochure and there was a tiny weeny advert for this rock climbing expedition. And I saw that and I thought, wow, that sounds cool. It was literally about four lines. It just said, the Silk Route climbers wanted. And I thought, well, I've done a little bit of climbing at school, on school trips, not really much, um, you know, on some adventurous activity holidays. And I was a gymnast as a child, so I was always quite athletic and sport, very sporty. Um, and I saw this advert, so I sent off um, for this brochure. And it was just this amazing brochure full of, you know, about all the different countries. And I just thought, wow, I want to do it. So I phoned the guy up, um, a guy called Stuart Marlow, um, who's sadly not with us anymore. But um, and he invited me to meet him. And I'm, you know, 17 at the time. And I travel up to London and I meet him on his houseboat. And he's quite a character, obviously. He's doing these crazy things. Um, and we had a brilliant time. And he said, right, well, you need to learn to rock climb. So I thought, okay. He said, he invited me down to these rocks called Harrison's Rocks, which are just south of London. They're like sandstone rocks. Took me climbing and we had a, I think I fell off and actually hurt myself, but kind of got up and laughed. And he was like, you'll be fine. Um, <laughs> and then, 
and then that was it. And then I had to kind of broach the subject with my parents and kind of said, I'm doing it basically. <laughs> well, that was more than broaching the subject. You already were a woman who pushed for more and said, this yeah. is what I want. This is what yeah. I'm doing. It doesn't matter that I'm 17 and technically considered still a minor. This is what I'm going to do. Yeah. And, and just went off to do it with very little experience, but certainly mm. courage and gumption yeah. and a sense of, I can do this. Yeah, most definitely. I think when you're young, well, I don't know. I think you don't see the negatives. You don't see what you can't do. You just see what you can do, which I, I kind of wish I had more of that now. I'm getting a bit older now. But I, I love that period of my life where you just say yes to things. You just don't even think about the consequences. I think it's brilliant. It's a brilliant time to be in, to embrace that time in, in, in life. It's great. Definitely the time to start having adventures anyway. <laughs> It definitely is. And, and I know that you say you're getting a little older now and certainly still a very young woman. Yeah. But we all go through this, right? It mm -hmm. seems the older we get, the more fearful yeah. we get and the more hesitation we have. Mm -hmm. But still, as a young woman, saying yeah. yes to everything has its yeah. drawbacks as well, obviously. It does. Yeah. Okay, yeah. so here you are with this wonderful gentleman and this expedition. Talk to us yeah. about the Silk Route, how long it took, and yeah. what it was like, and who you traveled with. Give us an idea. Right. Well, um, so the truck was a big Scania truck, and it was built in a barn in Oxfordshire, so made into an overland truck. And it even had a climbing wall on the back, which was pretty cool. Um, so I met the rest of the team literally at Dover, at the docks. My parents drove me up, um, which was very nice of them, um, and met all these other climbers. Most people were in their 20s, who I thought were incredibly grown up as a young, just turned 18 year old. Um, and yeah, off we went. So the first place I guess we went to was in France, across the channel. And we got just south of Paris, there's an area called Fontainebleau, which is like this amazing bouldering venue. So bouldering is climbing without ropes on kind of big, big boulder rocks. Um, and you and you just and, and it was just great fun. Um, there was a lot of climbing. There was a lot of drinking and partying when you're young. <laughs> so it was like the ultimate party cla traveling climbing truck it was just you know as a young 18 year old it was just like the best thing ever um we <laughs> yeah good time well how could it not but of course something so dangerous like boulder climbing and beer may not mix <laughs> yeah maybe we didn't do it drunk but um and, and you have things called bouldering pads so it's a bit like a crash pad so you put that at the bottom of the of the the boulders the the rock and then your friends spot you so that if you do fall off you don't hit your head or they can catch you or they can steady you so it's actually a relatively safe way of climbing as long as you look after each other um and if the in Fontainebleau the landings are actually often very flat it's quite sandy soils and it's um it's actually a really it's one of the most famous places to go climbing if you google Fontainebleau climbing it's you know, it's one of the world leading places to climb. So yeah, it's fab. So that so, was kind of our first stop. <laughs> okay. And then you went along from there to many, many stops, correct? Yeah. So we went France, Italy, Greece, Turkey, Iran, Pakistan, India, Nepal, Tibet, China, and then Hong Kong. Um, that was the route. <laughs> and uh, stopped in some amazing places to climb. You know, in Greece, there's a place called Meteora, which is these huge sandstone columns um, with kind of rocks and pebbles kind of in, it's like a conglomerate kind of rock. Um, and there's, there's even monasteries on the top of some of these towers. It's just mind blowing. It's an amazing place to climb. And at that point, I'd never like led a climb. I wasn't going first. I was getting dragged up by people because I didn't really know what I was doing. <laughs> so yeah, it was great. But you were still learning, which is a wonderful mm -hmm. thing. It sounded like yeah. you had a great group of people that were willing to teach you. Yeah. So how long did that whole expedition take? 
I think it was about seven months in total. So, yeah. <laughs> wow. Yeah. So did you save up enough money beforehand to go? How did you get the funds to make this happen? Well, it was quite a cheap trip considering what we did. So um, I think it cost about four and a half thousand pounds. I had been working at the local supermarket, so at a Waitrose all through sick form. Um, I also used to clean um, someone's house on the weekend as well to save up. Um, and then my granddad had passed away and I also gained some money from that too. So the combination of all those things, I had this kind of pot of money and luckily the trip, once we were on it, was actually very cheap because the evening, and me evening meals and breakfast were provided. Um, but that involved us actually um, cooking on a fire. So we camped, we wild camped almost everywhere. So we camped every night. Um, and there would be different jobs on the truck. So some people would be the fire starters. So that was my job. I lit the fire every day. Every, wherever we stopped, my job would be collect firewood, light the fire. So it was a bit of a fire starter. Um, <laughs> and then other people, and then like on a rotation system, it would be cooking, cook duty. So you do two, I think two dinners and two breakfasts and then another set of people. So there's up to about 20 people on the truck. Yeah. And, and you slept on the truck? No, we didn't sleep. We slept in tents. So oh, all see. the camping gear was kept in our lockers. In the truck. Um, and everything like that. So we had, there was like lockers on the side, big hold all bags with your clothes, your climbing kit, your tent, your sleeping bag. So yeah. that was your first foray, foray into rock climbing and certainly a taste mm -hmm. for a tremendous adventure and certainly an experience that is carried mm -hmm. with you for the next 20 years, correct? Yeah. That yeah, was the yeah. beginning for you those seven months. And you mm -hmm. said the person that started this is no longer with us. Yeah, and Stuart. I'm sorry about yeah. that. Um, have you mm -hmm. managed to maintain any friendships from the 20 people that you traveled with? Oh, yes. Yeah. So, well... Um, yeah, like some of my really great friends, you know, we, we all live in different parts of the country, some in different parts of the world, but when you phone someone up and have a chat or meet up with them, it's literally, it's like any good old friendship, isn't it? When you've done something like that, it doesn't matter if you haven't seen each other for five years, you just fall back into. Fall so, back. yeah, but I've got a couple of close girlfriends I do talk regularly who were on that trip. So, so. here you are, come back from mm -hmm. a a world tour and such yeah. an outdoor adventure and you are going on 19 I guess and what yeah. happened from there how did you pursue this situation going forward did you make a career out of it tell us about this yeah. job well on so my university results I got good results and I was due to go off to Swansea University in South Wales to do um, geography um, but I met a guy on the truck called Ben George and he had just finished university and he had done a degree in outdoor and environmental education. And I thought, wow, that sounds cool. He was off to work at Outward Bound in Hong Kong. So he was going to finish the trek, uh, finish the expedition and then start his new job. And um, I thought, wow, that sounds really cool. So I phoned my mum from China and I said, I don't want to do geography at Swansea anymore. I want to do this degree in outdoor education. And my dad wasn't very happy because obviously he wanted me to go to a traditional university and do a traditional degree. But my mum knows what I'm like and she's quite a strong woman, I guess. And maybe that's where I get it from. <laughs> and um, she said, go for it. So I did. And um, off I went off to Liverpool to study this. Liverpool John Moore's had an amazing, um, one of the oldest outdoor education degrees in the country. And that's where I went. So I did three years there. But I also did a lot of geography modules like glaciation of fluviology and natural hazards and applied geomorphology and things like that. So that if I wanted to go into teaching, which I later did, I had enough credits, I guess, to do a geography-based um, teacher training. So even so I, then, I, I'm sorry. Yeah. So even then, you had the foresight to to go forward. Well, you said some yeah. very interesting things, and we'll talk about that for you know for a minute about what you've studied. But uh, yeah. I really do appreciate the fact that I think that pushy broads, which as we know as 
I gave a backronym to be uh, powerful, unafraid, self-aware, hardworking, young at heart females, normally get their start from other pushy broads, mm, from women yes. who paved the way many, many, many yeah. times. And it sounds like your mother is one of those women. Yeah, my my mum is, um, she's only tiny, but she's a force not to be reckoned with. <laughs> I don't think she'd mind me saying that, but um, yeah, she did some quite, for her time, you know, she's 70 now, but she went to a grammar school. She was very intelligent, you know, got great A-levels, could have gone off to university straight away. And she said, I don't want to go straight to university. I want, I want to career so she joined the police and um she joined as a cadet and back then in the probably the 60s or 70s there weren't many women police officers so i guess she was already making her own little waves um so she and then she went off um to university through the police so they wanted more graduates and she actually got paid to go to university so lucky her <laughs> costs a lot of people a lot of money nowadays but she was very lucky um, well, she but she timed also, it right. yeah timed it right um but she also had an adventurous spirit and actually a lot of things have come out as i've got older of things she's done like she she went off to cape wrath um as a young cadet on this course called a john ridgeway course and he was kind of pioneering at the time for his adventurous activities they would um you know be asked to jump off a boat take all their clothes off and swim to shore with their clothes in a bag and survive on an island for a week without and she went and did all things like that and, it, and it's only since i've got older that she's kind of come out with more of these stories so yeah she's actually quite she's a bit of a dark horse really mom she'll never tell you you know she would never <laughs> yeah well, she sounds wonderful, and she also sounds like somebody I would like to have on my show. So ask her if she wants to be, okay. <laughs> wants to have a conversation with me, quite honestly yeah. and truly, because it's really important just to show mm. women that are not only uh, in their young teens or their late teens or or in yeah. their 20s or 30s like you, but women that are your mother's age and my age, that it is our experiences that help and inspire other women and push everybody forward and that um, our experiences enrich us. So that's really powerful. And certainly where you got that from and certainly her sense of freedom and her sense of go for broke, take a risk, take a risk and challenge yeah. yourself um, yeah. allows you to in part be the woman that you are today. Yeah. I mean, if I think about now looking at an 18 year old, I look at 18 year olds now and I think they look so young <laughs> and, and I think, oh my God, my parents let me go across the Silk Route. They didn't even, we didn't even have an argument. It was like, okay, who is this man? Okay. <laughs> and it was like, off you go. But having that, I think, trust to allow me to do that was huge, you know, and I'm so grateful because I sometimes think the more you tell people to stop doing things, the more they rebel. And um, I never really had anything to rebel against. My, both my parents were in the police and so maybe they saw a lot of things um, from people maybe being overproductive and not, there's definitely, you learn from risk, don't you? And if, the more trust you're given to do things, the more you'll actually be able to cope with stuff in the long run. So. Absolutely. There's no question. I do empowerment coaching and I've been around behavioral health for the past 16 years. There is such a thing called oppositional defiance, which means the more you tell me I can't do something, the more I want to do yeah. it. So yeah. once you're given permission to do something, then you really have to discern for yourself whether or not mm. it's something that you want to do. And yeah. like you said, excuse me, your parents instilled upon you responsibility and accountability and more than ever trusted your judgment. So that's yeah. a plus. That is. So, so. <laughs> okay. So here you are coming out of university and then what? Yeah. Oh, what did I do then? So I moved to Scotland, um, to Glasgow, um, which, um, so I got a job working for, it was a charity called Activate, but they had a special project called, uh, well, sorry, it was a charity called Fairbridge, but we had a special, special project called Activate working with young um 
boys who had been expelled from school. So we were using the outdoors to teach them um, leadership, um, self-worth. Um, so we had two days a week outdoor activities with them and then two days a week classroom based learning. So I did both. And it was actually very funny because the outdoor team was all men and the indoor team was all women. And I used to cross between the two. <laughs> and, I, and I found it really interesting how the boys would respond to the different male and female teachers. And um, I could then question them and say, well, you wouldn't do that with so-and-so and things like that. So yeah, it was really, it was really um, very humbling work, very, um, you know, children from very disaffected families, very poor families, um, but very incredibly worthwhile work, yeah. And then it took you to 25 years old where you led a bunch of climbers from South Africa overland to Jordan. How did that come about? Okay, so I guess um, I then got a job up in Applecross, which is a really remote place up in Scotland. It's this beautiful, it's opposite the Isle of Skye. So you might have heard of the Isle of Skye. It's about five hours north of, so I worked there with 16 to 25 year old people with drug and alcohol problems leading expeditions, like um, lots of walking and trekking, canoeing, sea kayaking expeditions. But we would get, we would take long periods off as well. So in between that time, I would do quite a lot of um, overseas expedition work as well for different companies. Um, and then that's when I got the phone call about this hot rock trip, this Africa trip. Did I want to leave that? Um, I'd just come out of a long-term relationship, so I kind of needed to escape. <laughs> so someone asking me, do you want to lead a trip to Africa? I was like, hell yes, <laughs> I'm, I'm off. <laughs> that's a great idea. <laughs> so, you know, I was doing a lot of traveling. I'd been to, you know, in fact, just before that trip, I'd been leading a trip in India trekking and then I came back um, and then got asked to, yeah, if I wanted to do that trip. So, yeah. Wonderful. So you've led expeditions all over the world. Yeah. A long time. Mm -hmm. What have you learned over the years about who you are and what this has done for you? Oof. I think I've learned that I'm pretty good in a crisis. I don't flap too much. Um, obviously, things can go wrong. Um, I think I'm oft, I'm, I'm really good when I'm kind of, I don't know, when I'm, ha when I'm put in a hard situation, I normally rise to it. So I think it teaches you that you're a lot better at things than you think you are. And Sorry. I think... I'm sorry. Yeah. Go ahead. Go ahead. <laughs> you carry on. <laughs> so it gave you self confidence. Yeah. It gave yeah. you an opportunity to face uh, difficult situations and handle crises, like you said. Yeah. What were some of the things you had to face that um, you were able to overcome? Um, oh, gosh. The Africa trip, I guess, was a lot of being diplomatic at borders. Um, knowing how to get to kind of work your magic really kind of i think just talking to other people as human beings being polite being modest being respectful gets you a long way so it doesn't matter what culture you're in if you can respect that culture then you normally get something back from that if you go in demanding i am a westerner and i <laughs> you know i'm better than you it's like no you're not <laughs> You're in my country. You need to respect our, our our rules and our. So I think just just being human with people, just being nice. Um, we, I don't know that we've had so many. It's hard to think of things really. There's so many things to deal with all the time. <laughs> you're always. I think you're always problem solving. <laughs> Absolutely. Tell me, as a woman in this industry, in leading expeditions and getting out there and forging new pathways, did you find it particularly difficult to be accepted as a woman expert in this field? Um, yeah, I guess when I, I mean, I, I get told I look young for my age now, which is very nice people. Um, but when I was 25, I obviously looked about 16. So... <laughs> 
I think people were often a bit bemused that I was in charge. Um, but I also think it, it helped because sometimes when you're a five foot three female, um, it allows you to use a little bit of charm, use a bit of cheekiness. You can get away with things um, quite well. So I think there's pros and cons. Sometimes, yes, in different cultures, um, obviously in Arabic countries where women aren't, it's a different respect, I guess. Um, and normally the men would be dealing with these kind of jobs. So sometimes I would be talking and I had a driver on the truck and they would be talking, I would be talking to them and then they would be answering to him and then I would be talking and it would be this very odd conversation. But it, I couldn't not, I couldn't be unhappy with them because it's just their culture. So you kind of accept it. It can be frustrating. You can't, it's, you can't change a whole country's way of living. So you kind of just go with it. But a lot of the time, even though that was their culture, they still were very lovely to me and very nice. I never had particularly bad experiences. And what about people in your field, other rock climbers? How many women are you? Is there a large population of females doing what you do? Oh, yeah. I mean, where I live, there are some of the most, I feel quite an average climber because there's some of the most talented rock climbers in the world. We've got um, Hazel Finley, who lives just at the end of the lake. Um, we've got Emma Twyford, all of which both women, you know, climb incredibly hard. Lots of the local women here, um, you know, the people, a lot of people have moved to, to the area for the climbing, but there's a, it's a huge amount. It's almost probably 50, maybe it's not quite 50, 50, but there seems there is a lot of women that climb. Um, but I guess as women then have children, um, what they can actually do in their free time then obviously slows up. So they change, there's often a natural change in sports. I've noticed with friends who used to climb, but it takes up a lot of time. So then they'll they get more in their, into their road biking or their running because that can get done in short bursts. You can go out for a quick hour, whereas climbing is often like a half a day or a day. So there's definitely a shift. Well, I'm glad to hear that there are lots of women making inroads in this, not only for a hobby, but as a business as well. Yeah, there's a lot of, um, there's quite a lot of um, ladies that work here and that are friends that all have their own businesses working in the outdoors. Um, and in my other job where I'm part time as a teacher of geography and outdoor education, I work for um, Coventry City Council. And we have inner city children from England coming to the Welsh Hills um, to a centre called Place Dolomoc. And um, the staff team is about 80 percent women <laughs> and only about 20 percent men. And, and we are all outdoor instructors. We're, we're teachers and outdoor instructors, but it's a huge percentage that are women, which is quite un. I think in some centres there's a lot less women, but for some reason our centre there's a lot of women. So I often, I don't feel that um, there's not many of us because I feel like I'm always surrounded by women. <laughs> and they're all strong, strong girls, you know, everyone's, it's always like, do you want to go for a swim in the lake? Do you want to go for a climb? Do you want to go for a bike? There's no, it does, I don't feel like we're a minority. I think we're like quite equal. These are not yeah. the women that just want to sit around and have a cup of tea or chat. <laughs> you, know, you want to do that, you know, uh, 5,000 feet up. I understand yeah. that where you are in Clan Barris, you are very close to one of the largest mountain range, if that not the largest mountain, I think, in, in Wales. Tell me about that. Yeah, we've got Snowdon, which is the highest mountain in Wales, just on our doorstep. Um, and it's a real tourist attraction. So you get all walks of life walking up this mountain, often in completely inappropriate clothing and <laughs> not wearing the right shoes or don't even have waterproofs. Um, so it has become a bit of a, for the local people that obviously grew up here and you know a very close knit community, you've got that whole um, issue of maybe people buying second homes because it's um, seen as an area of outstanding natural beauty. Um, so there's a lot of kind of conflict. People don't want to lose the Welsh language. So it's an interesting time, especially due to COVID, um, where there's a lot of people not working. So they're on furlough. I we have a scheme in the UK where 
the government is paying the wages of our companies while you can't work. So um, we're very lucky at the moment to have that. But it does mean there's a lot of people as well, because of travel restrictions, a lot of people in the UK will go to Greece and Turkey and Spain and France just for that, you know, just for a week's holiday because it's so close. So all those people that would normally fly abroad because of travel restrictions and self-isolating, like if you come back, you have to like not go into work for 14 days. Everyone's holidaying here, which means the hills, well, Snowden, if you go to any other hill, they're not on it. <laughs> it's like, <laughs> it's busy. It's really busy. So not where I live. I live up the hill a bit. But. <laughs> you reminded me when you said the hills, you reminded me of Julie Andrews and Sound of Music. Oh. The hills are alive. Yeah. With with climbers um yeah. that's really funny that's funny so yeah. have you climbed snowden or or most of it oh. or how far have you gotten oh i've climbed it tons of times probably tons over 100 times. times but it's it's a walk you can walk up snowden you don't there are climbs on snowden rock climbs um but the majority 99 percent of people going up snowden walk up it and there's like about five different main routes up the mountain um and it's, yeah, people call it hiking. I always call it walking, but hiking, walking, same thing. <laughs> um, yeah, so the tourists go walking up the mountain. They, they'll say they've climbed it, but we, if you're a climber, you're like, you walked it. <laughs> but I'm just being you're, panicking. If you're not hanging on by the side no. with, your, yeah. you know, with your bare hands, then of course you've yeah. walked. Uh, how yeah. tall is that mountain? Oh God, I should know this. Um, this is a very no, it's okay. Question. We'll look at we'll look it up for you. Three thousand and oh, I so should About know this. Three thousands and something. It's okay. okay. All right. Yeah. Eighteen. So three thousand eighteen meters. Yeah. So that's something that even I could do. I could walk. Oh up. yeah. Yes. Yeah. Okay. okay. <laughs> But I certainly couldn't climb it, that's for sure. So <laughs> here you are, let's go back for a second. You've gone to South Africa, overland to Jordan. You've taken that expedition, you've come home. Yep. And yep. where did your life take you? Oh gosh, right, where did it take me? I think I went to Canada for a little bit to go climbing, <laughs> just for fun. Um, Cause I was working on that trip, so I was actually earning money. Um, uh, I was in a relationship, but it wasn't a good relationship. So um, I had to get out of that <laughs> and did, thank God. Where did I go from there? I did a lot of freelance work. So then I was kind of doing a lot of work, um, some, a couple more expeditions. I think I went off to Venezuela, to Peru, Ecuador, um, taking people trekking in the mountains. Um, and, and a lot of work in the UK as well. So kind of lots of trekking, Duke of Edinburgh work um, and working for different centers around the country until I got a job at Plaza Brennan, which is the National Mountain Center. And that's, that was a kind of a turning point for me for like qualifications, I guess, kind of going up the ladder on that sense. Yeah. And what did you do there? So I became something called an assistant instructor. So you work as an, as an, cause it's quite a prestigious place to work. So in the UK, um, you've got the three, I guess, mountain cent national mountain centers. You've got Plaza Brennan, in, which is in Wales, but it's actually the English mountain center. You've got um, Glenmore Lodge up in Scotland. And then you've got Tullamore, which is in Ireland. Um, so it's, it's quite a, if you're going to work in the outdoors, it's like one of the best places you can work because you learn so much from incredibly experienced instructors. Yeah. So you moved on from there and just to bring us to where you are now, just kind yeah. of give a quick synopsis of how you came to do what you do right now. Um, well, I, so I worked there and I absolutely loved it and I carried on freelancing for Placid Brennan um, over the years as well, but I actually hurt my shoulder um, I tore, um, had a label tear um, from a, uh, a wheelbarrow race at a Hindu. <laughs> wait a minute, wait a minute. Stop right there. Stop right there. You've climbed yeah. all over the world. Yeah. You've climbed everywhere. You've done all yeah. kinds of expeditions and yeah. you hurt your body, right? Yeah. This was, you, you've never really hurt your body before in all of mm -hmm. these expeditions, even mm -hmm. as a novice climber and all of that yeah. stuff. And yeah. you hurt 
your body on the ground in a yeah. wheelbarrow. Yeah. That's hilarious. <laughs> I know. You can't make it up, can you? Yeah. Tell yeah. us about so, that. Well, um, so my friend Poppy, who I was at university with, and she had moved to North Wales, and we've re remained friends ever since. Um, it was her hen do, and I would say her hen do was a little bit more like a stag do, because we're all quite tomboy. So part of that hen do was um, deep sea fishing out off the North Wales coast. Quite a lot of drink involved. I think we ended up in a dodgy club in Bangor. Bad. Um, and I think the next day we had a bonfire at the beach and we were engaging in silly games. And then we were having a wheelbarrow race and I'm quite competitive. So obviously I wanted to win. <laughs> Gave it my full beans and <laughs> ripped my, tore my shoulder muscle. Yeah. So that was a disaster. <laughs> So that certainly prevented you from doing some of the climbing that you wanted to continue, correct? Yeah, so that had quite a big effect on my career at that point. So I thought, mm, your body obviously doesn't stay young forever. And I kind of wanted a backup plan. So I decided to apply to do a teacher training course at Aberystwyth University. So in geography. And that's why my thinking you know all those years ago paid off because i'd done the right amount of credits to do that and yeah, about so how about how long are you teaching now um oh gosh i think about seven years now so but i was lucky i was very lucky because the actual teaching in schools is incredibly full-on as you know you know there's a lot of planning a lot of prep a lot of sleepless nights, you know, just because you have to do so much work, don't you, to get ready to teach a lesson. Um, but I was very lucky that I finished my teacher training year. I did really well, got good marks. And then I got offered a job at this outdoor centre that needed teachers because they wanted the geography teaching side to do the field studies. So I got the best of both worlds. Um, I got to teach outdoor education. So all the fun stuff like the climbing and the canoeing and the mountain climbing. But then I also got to deliver the geography field study side as well. You know, this is really fascinating, especially mm -hmm. since you're delivering this to young children, correct? These are, these are curriculums yeah. for young children. Yeah, so this is like, we do a mix of stuff. So we do primary, primary education, and then we do secondary, but then we also do special needs. And then we also work with adults kind of on special adult weekend courses. So we have a really nice variety of work. Yeah. I, mean, I don't find much of that in the United States. I mean, it, during the, you know, the general regular curriculums, you know, they have regular gym teachers that do all kinds of things indoors, yeah. but there aren't those kinds of activities that you've mentioned, not rock climbing really, or mm -hmm. canoeing or things like that. I think there should be more programs that answer to that the way there are in the UK. Yeah. That's fabulous. So would you mind sharing how old you are now with us? I'm 38 years old. <laughs> And if you take yeah. a look at her on YouTube, Transformation Talk Radio listener, she looks 28. Oh. Uh, so, yes, <laughs> yes, Emma, you actually do. So you've been able mm. to do this successfully for the past seven years. Talk yeah. to us a little bit about the kinds of things you impart on your students. What else do you want them to get from what you're doing in addition to just the basic skill of what you're teaching? Um, I guess one of our main things at Place de la Mocque, which is the outdoor centre, um, is, is a sense of respect for the environment. So that's a real thing that we, we kind of try and make them understand how important nature is. You know, this is the only earth we've got and we've got to look after it. And as humans, we're kind of abusing it, really. We're, we're kind of take, take, take and we're not really giving back. So it's having that respect for the environment and understanding what things are in nature. I think if you, if you learn the name of a plant, then you, you probably have more respect for that plant. If you, if you actually spend time in nature, you're gonna spend, you'll actually have more appreciation for it and more respect. So that's one of our big kind of ethoses of the center. We even have, every morning we have duty groups and one of those groups for the kids to go and do is called the Eco Squad. And they, um, you know, they have to go around and count birds and, and pick up litter and, 
and and just lots of little jobs that are really fun but it just gives them a sense of purpose and a sense of responsibility yeah that's absolutely marvelous are do you find as you're teaching that there are some young girls in there that could be taking after emma warren rock oh yeah i often say to them do you want to be an outdoor instructor <laughs> sometimes they're like no <laughs> But sometimes they're like, yeah, that, that sounds cool. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. So it's are good you to inspire them? I'm sorry, one more time. It's, it's good to inspire the next generation. Yeah, definitely. It really is. So mm -hmm. when we started this conversation beforehand and you responded to my ad, have you thought about yourself as a woman who pushed for more? Do you know, I hadn't really, but as the more we talk the more I think oh maybe I did <laughs> makes me appreciate yeah that I I have actually always strived a little bit to do interesting things and maybe push against the norms yeah definitely. without a doubt I mean that I saw right away from everything you did from the beginning and sometimes it's not about pushing for more so that the world knows no. it's about pushing for more for your own personal goals to make yeah. your life more fulfilling. So I think that's oh, maybe yes. what you've been gravitating towards. Yes. Yeah, definitely. Definitely. I think um, just always wanting to have new adventures, really, you know, as I'm, as I kind of got this other job, which stopped me from, I guess, doing the expedition side of things as much, because obviously I had a, a commitment to them and it's quite hard to get the time off to then do the other work that I liked. Um, I started to do, have a lot more adventures for myself with friends and you know my husband so my husband's a mountain guide when I met him he was going through the British mountain guide scheme so we would have a lot of adventures and I felt like my I kind of rather than traveling the world you know to a lot of developing countries I saw a lot more of Europe and the European Alps because of I guess the way our lives changed as my husband said you grew, grew, grew up a bit <laughs> I don't know. Yeah. Well, that sounds like a wonderful love story. The the mountain mm. climber and the rock climber getting together. Yes. Yeah. The expedition tour guide. Yeah. So when I got the job at Plaza Brennan, the National Mountain Centre, he was um, he was an instructor already working there. And when I moved to Wales, my friend Jenny, who lives in the Alps, she had heard of this lady called Catherine Thomas, and she rented rooms out. In, in North Wales to, you know, other climbers and things like that. She had like a shared house type thing and she would go off to Antarctica um, to work with the penguins for the British Antarctic Survey. So, so many, I feel like I'm surrounded by strong women, but she was an amazing woman. Anyway, so I moved into this house where my husband was li also living, but he'd been working in Scotland. So I had about a month living there working at the center before he came back. And then I thought, oh, Hello, <laughs> who are you? He's a six foot four strapping man. And uh, yeah, and we went climbing lots together. And then we obviously had the same passions and the same interests and kind of all worked out. So that was about 10 years ago. Yeah. That was about 10 years ago. Unbelievable. Mm. Okay, yeah. so what's on the horizon for you next? Oh, well, with COVID, who knows? <laughs> I feel like we're in a bit of treading water time. So I guess at the moment, I think it's really appreciating what you've got on your doorstep. So I don't know if you've watched any of David Attenborough's stuff, but obviously, you know, the world is in a quite a hard, you know, with global warming and things like that. I feel like there's so many adventures that we can have on our own doorsteps just during our lockdown. So I don't know what it was like over in your part of the world but we weren't allowed to travel by car anywhere we we were literally just where we were we could go out for an hour um daily exercise but they also shut the national park which is what i'm surrounded by so suddenly we had all this freedom that kind of got shrunk and it was really much what, what you could do lo like really locally so i guess what we started to do was um we've got a wood behind us which is a beautiful woodland but it's starting to get invaded by rhododendron which is an in invasive species and it stops um, all the local like the native plants growing and it makes the soil acidic and blah 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 
So we took it upon ourselves to start clearing that of rhododendron as something to do. And we, my husband built an owl box and now we've got an owl in the wood called Mr. Twiddles. Uh, <laughs> and like, it was really very much about exploring what's on in your back garden almost, appreciating the nature that is like, you start to notice all the tiny birds that would come come into your garden because you have so much more time just to appreciate the nature that, that is, you know, just in our tiny little bit of the world. So I, I guess it's hard to have plans. I've got lots of things I want to do, places I want to go back to. Um, for example, I, I've been ice climbing in, in Norway quite a lot recently and ski touring in Norway, um, which is amazing. Um, ski touring in Iceland was, I'd love to go back there, but I feel like we lucked out on the weather, so I'm not sure I can go. But there's all these like places in Europe I, I'd love to, you know, carry on climbing and skiing and ski touring, just little micro adventures, I guess. But at the moment, it's literally adventures on our doorstep because I think we're possibly heading for another lockdown. So it's very, it's very interesting what you say. And this is a really good mm. message for our listeners. I've done yeah. so many podcasts on, of course, COVID-19 and how it, it has affected us and, and all of yeah. this give us an added perspective. The hope is, and the hopefulness is that even though you have been around the world, you are taking special notice of the things that are closest to you right now. And that's a wonderful thing. And not only are you taking special notice, but you're doing something about it. Like you said, kind of eliminating the, the, the backwoods of rhododendron and, and really making the best of where you are in this more closed situation. Yeah. And you can have aspirations and you can have dreams. And we all have mm -hmm. to know that no matter what, things will not stay this way forever. Yeah. And certainly yeah. we all have to wait for a vaccine and that's part of science and that's part of how long it goes. And, and maybe we will be in between different kinds of viruses that come down. I don't know. We don't know what this world holds. But yeah. you said some very important things and, and that is to really take a look at what you have around you, understand mm -hmm that the world still is a pretty big one out here and you can yeah, yeah. redirect and refocus your thinking to make a difference no matter how large or small your world is correct yeah yeah definitely I feel like you know if you if we all started planting a couple more trees in each neighborhood think how many more trees there would be in the world if everyone planted one tree if everyone stopped maybe using shower gel in a box bottle and had a soap you know it's these tiny little changes but if there's billions of people in the planet if we all made those tiny changes people think i can't make a change you know i'm not a vegetarian i have been in the past um but i've decided you know if i buy meat it's going to be good meat from the local butchers it's going to be local meats i'm probably going to eat less meats um, try and buy local veg, um, think about, it's just all those little changes, maybe not buying so much clothing. If you do buy clothing, maybe buy ethical clothing, um, go on eBay, buy secondhand stuff. Um, things, brands like Patagonia um, are great because they give 1% of their money back to the planet and so back to really good causes. So maybe it's thinking about who you spend your money with. Buy local, don't buy your coffee from a massive chain buy it from a lovely little little i know coffee shop or a tea shop um just little changes but they all have, it has a little ripple effect doesn't it so we can't do big things but we can do little things and we're <laughs> all capable of little things for sure yeah we're all definitely. capable of little things so mm. tell me give me an idea of what you want to leave with our listeners out there some imparting words as to what you have plans for what we should look for tell us a little bit about what's on your site and what we should look for and also what kind of message in addition to what you said do you want to leave with our viewers and our listeners today Ooh, i would say um you're probably way more capable than you ever think you are so Maybe if someone offers you something that you think you wouldn't normally try, just say, say yes, I did that today. I wrote you an email. I wouldn't normally do that. And I thought, do you know what? I need to start saying yes again. Like, like that 18 year old self. Um, yeah. Try not to be too scared to try new things. 
And I think one of the most important things, which I do need to work out, that is not being scared to fail because we learn so much when we don't get things right and that's okay. I think in society, everything, you know, Instagram, Facebook, everything has to be perfect. You have to have the perfect hair and the perfect teeth and the perfect smile. But that's not reality, you know, and actually it's all right to make mistakes and it's all right to try new things and not be great at it first time. But it's having, I guess it's having a growth mindset. It's being like willing to like try new things, embrace new things, not being too scared, not being scared to make a fool of yourself. You're never too old. <laughs> that's exactly right. And you are never too old. I am yeah. so thrilled to know you. I am thrilled to hear all, all of your stories. I gave you some great ideas as to how to proceed and you could do that in your own little world. And yeah. I will be first online to watch that progress. So please let me know how it goes. If you'll take me up on some of the suggestions I gave you. Yeah. Yeah. And, um, yes, yes. <laughs> and uh, your information will be uh, here for our, our listeners to contact mm -hmm. you if, if they are in the area and they want to know more about you and your story. I am yeah. so glad to know you as a true pushy broad and by your own admission, maybe more of a woman who pushed for more than she actually thought. Yes. Yes, definitely. <laughs> I hope you've enjoyed being with me today. Oh, thank you so much for having me on your show. It's been wonderful. I loved it. <laughs> thank you. This is Ellen Stewart, the pushy broad from the Bronx, saying thanks for listening. And remember, everybody needs a little push. From the pushy broad from the Bronx, New York.